The day has arrived, unveiling my first ever luxury watch purchase. Truth be told, I have been studying, examining and trying on watches for months before coming to a conclusion, and part one of this series really helped me move my thoughts in the right direction. It always feels better putting thoughts to paper. As this channel has grown, and I have talked about everything from homage to entry level to luxury, horterology, the process has taught me a lot about my tastes. The real goal then, when deciding on a watch, was to find something that satisfied many areas, and for it, hopefully, to be a watch that expresses what I communicate on this channel, something that has a history, a terrific name behind it, character, and something that has been incredibly well designed. It's so easy to fill a vacancy or a want, maybe to scratch the itch, like a supplementary purchase. But going that extra step, spending more on something that you really, truly want, makes it so much more worthwhile. The greatest lesson from this experience is that it must hurt. It has got to hurt. One of the most brilliant statements ever made by Archie Luxury. Paying for something like this, the level of commitment that kicks you in the groin and leaves you dedicated to what you bought is what it's all about. And this purchase really did hurt, but it is a once in a lifetime opportunity. The price was right, and if I had let it slip, someone else would have taken it. It was a fulfilling moment. Spending a small fortune and putting it into something that I know will last me forever. So the question, what was the watch? Rolex, Omega or Tudor? You saw the title of the video and the cover photo, but all were considered. See part one for a more lengthy discussion around the brands. It will be in the corner of the screen. From Rolex, the Explorer stood out to me the most because of the numeral placement. And next to it was the 14060 Submariner. From Omega, the Seamaster 300 and the Aquaterra, because both watches epitomize the modern design development of the brand. And from Tudor, the Black Bay 58. On the screen, you are seeing this set as a group together. Interesting lineup. The Explorer has golden aesthetics, simple but effective 369 numeral layout that is so attractive. The size is understated and not overbearing. The Submariner, with its simple dial, functional bezel, would make for such a practical everyday wearer. The design styling of the Seamaster 300, with callbacks to vintage references and a gorgeous symmetry to the dial. The Aquaterra that manages to epitomize the Omega brand with its use of sharp batons, hands, classic case styling, articulating bracelets, and the Tudor Black Bay with an added vintage touch. The more I thought about it, the more I wanted a watch that managed to combine aspects from each. Impossible? Surprisingly not. I really wanted this piece to fill many criteria and stand in as a watch that wouldn't be polarizing, simple enough to wear every day compact and smaller than average in size, unique to its family, and one that doesn't stand out in the crowd. And so, opening up the outer box reveals the answer. This is not your typical logo on an outer box for a watch like this, quite a telltale sign. And for more finality, the red box is quite a giveaway. The reference CK2913, Omega Seamaster 300, 1957 Trilogy Reissue. A work of art. You might have noticed over time that I have hinted about these Trilogy watches often enough, and the 57 Seamaster is a watch that I first saw in a shop window well over two years ago, and I think the seed was planted back then. Unboxing the watch was an experience. First, I need to thank Swiss Watch Trader for the utterly brilliant service. The packaging was top class and it was delivered to me the next day at 11 a.m. And I will link to their website in the comments of this video. I implore you to have a look at what they have on offer. Opening up the box felt like stepping into a time capsule, being transported back into that point of our history when brands were showing off how well they could dress up their watches. A sturdy, heavy casing. Very surprising, actually. It really commands a presence. A beautiful color and period correct red and gold exterior with a corduroy lined interior. The classic Omega high precision logo. It felt special. Owner's manual, authenticity cards, and such a nice touch. A book explaining the history of the Seamaster 300 with original technical drawings, advertisements, specifications. This is how any watch should be packaged. 
It has become such a lost art nowadays, and it feels like so many companies just don't care enough. To think that as a buyer, who has spent so much on a purchase, that you might be lucky to find a sticker or two on your watch. Think about how different things were 20 or 30 years ago when you received original advertising. This atmosphere created by the packaging, a small book telling you why you made an excellent purchase, the substance behind the watch itself. The accessories were also great. A European suede leather travel pouch, dark mocha brown NATO strap, even the strap felt substantial and different in texture, and a leather strap to go with it, all with embossed Omega logos on the clasps. Great additions. To the watch itself, why the 57 Seamaster? To me it is one of Omega's best kept secrets. Let's just address the general design of the watch. Of all the models in Omega's sports lineup, especially when looking at the dive or water-going watches, this to me is the establisher. We look at models like the Planet Ocean and the Aquaterra, both of which I believe express the real DNA of Omega's design language in this category the best. And when we look at the 57, we can see where all of the inspiration came from. It is one watch that epitomizes this segment of the Omega family from start to finish, whether it's looking at the case, the bracelet, dial, handset, bezel, everything is original and unique to the Seamaster 300. That was one of the most important elements that I hunted for. Every single component is unique to the watch. Next, the aesthetics and size. This is what blew me away the most. Often you have heard me talk about proportions, balance on the dial, the use of space allocation and the natural blend of case size and bracelet width. For my tastes and for what I was looking for, the proportions of this watch are simply perfect. Ever so slightly undersized case measuring 38.6 millimeters and a bracelet that measures in the ballpark of 18.6 millimeters with no taper. It wears and feels so substantial on the wrist for its size, but at the same time is small and discreet enough to be worn every day that it flies under the radar, unrecognized. The lugs, straight cut, that taper in a way almost like a cushion case towards the bracelet. Finely cut chamfers along the edges. This was done before we saw the characteristic turn-in lug designs of the professional models. It visually looks so light but feels compact. And then it's addressing the case height. No clear case back and such a flat profile, it wears very low on the wrist. I wanted a watch that would not be polarizing. Something that was not focused on a certain color scheme, but also one that has a perfect balance on its dial. Essentially a piece I could pick up and wear without a second thought about whether it would be appropriate or not. Whether it would be too large, too heavy, too complicated. Often I have spoken about how sports watches of the 50s were experiments. Pieces made to try and fit both occasions of formal and informal wear. That in part is why they were made small. And this watch to me is a model that rides the line of being on both sides of the fence. The numerals at the quarters, then backed by shark teeth batons and an equally aggressive minute track. The relationship shared between the hands and the batons. Honestly, I've never been able to look at a watch and instantly tell you the time to the minute. Since we're talking about the watch as a watch, Time telling is so easy, with a broad arrow and a corresponding Dauphine hand. Through my time seeking for an explorer-esque aesthetic, I did want a dial to be the focal point. And the idea of having the bezel so small and out of the way, almost like an afterthought, helps heighten the aesthetic quality in my opinion. The bezel is there, but only when you want it, sitting neatly in the background. And it functions unlike conventional bezels, being able to turn both ways and actually has a more practical application for countdown timing. Instead of lining up the pip with the minute hand, you instead line up the amount of time you want elapsed. So say you are cooking something in the oven for 20 minutes, line up the 20 to the hand, and when it reaches the pip, you've hit your mark. Simple. The bezel could be used the conventional way as well, you just have to swap the numerals around. Overall it feels so intact, simple, functional, and symmetrical everywhere you look. The broad arrow really completes the formula, adding so much more emphasis to the reading experience. The seconds hand reaches the full length of the dial, and often I've spoken about models that look too symmetrical, like the Aquaterra, and how your eyes can get lost in the dial because of the symmetry. What saves this piece for me is the balance between the Arabics and the Batons. 
At a glance you can center your attention on the dial, and in certain lights those white numerals really do come into their own. The faux patina, love it or hate it, I think it adds another dynamic to the dial. It tones it down and makes it feel less lively. I also like the fact that it resembles the rich ochre of radium instead of tritium. For a watch that mirrors an original piece, patina like this is acceptable. And the loom is fantastic. The large pip on the bezel holds a long charge. And surprisingly, it's very easy to tell the time in the dark with such symmetrical batons. Also, the tropical matte finish on the dial shines in different lights, adding to that visual complexity. This dial layout really feels like Omega to the core. Then to the bracelet. This style is completely unique to the 57 trilogy. Fat links in the center, thinner on the sides with more links and articulation than the Seamaster 300 ceramic with an added articulating end link. This combined with the case back lets it wear so thin and it feels rock solid. The brushing on the center links and polishing on the outer is terrific. I say that because of how it plays with the light. Subtle and visually makes the bracelet look thinner. Run your finger down it and it feels like snakeskin. The clasp, much smaller than the conventional Seamaster Professional, but complements the case size well. It definitely helps counter the weight of the case. But there's no writing on the clasp, just a simple raised logo milled out of the steel. Fantastic. Great callback to the original stamp clasps of the era. Less is more. Twin trigger deployant and an easy to use micro adjust system that doesn't need you to take the watch off at any time. The subtlety of it all just adds to the experience. It fits like a glove. It feels tailor made. And my wrist is 6.75 inches or 17 centimeters for your reference. And then if we are to look at the nuances, like the period correct case back, the naiad symbol on the crown, calling back to their technology of the time, the laser etched Omega logo on the inside of the domed sapphire crystal, the original printing and logo on the dial, with no superfluous information about the movement, just Seamaster 300. The details are everywhere and it feels so complete as a package. It gives you the impression that it was not just machined, boxed and sold. It wears and appears like so much more care went into every component. Talking about the movement, caliber 8806, master coaxial, 35 joules, and after a week of wear, it is currently running plus one. These Metas movements are powerhouses, and that assurance is another huge take home point. I really like the idea that it looks like a simple old watch, but on the inside, it's bulletproof. Now yes, many will buy a watch like this and keep it looking pristine. They are collectible. There are only 3,000 of them in the world, which is quite rare for Amiga to produce pieces like these in such small numbers. There are many polished surfaces on the watch, and it is going to get scratched, but that is all a part of the fun. I don't intend to baby it because I never intend to sell it, and here's why. This is a very special watch to me, not only being my first, but my father was born in the year that the originals were made, in 1957. My grandparents wore Omega. Grandfather owned a Seamaster from the 60s. The reference number, 2913, those four digits rearranged correspond exactly with my date of birth. Beyond sentiment, when we think about the originality of a watch, it is very hard to find a true original, one that started it all. And there's something innately special about owning a watch that established a brand. This Seamaster 300 is the originator that links to the modern line of Seamasters we see today. The Planet Ocean, the Professional, the Aqua Terra. And if we want the X Factor, owning the OG is a nice way to go. Especially if you are an enthusiast. But what does it manage to fulfill? Basically every category I can think of that really has ever impacted me greatly in this hobby. Put it on and it is a thing of beauty. It is a sports diver, classical cues, but performs and holds those modern standards. It's simple, dressy, casual, functional, practical, understated. What else does it need to be? It could be the one watch that lasts me for the rest of my life and I love that sentiment. In the end, I wanted impact. Something with a deeper meaning. Something different and unrecognizable and I am just blown away by this timepiece. So instead of picking a watch like an Explorer or a Submariner, a Tudor, a Seamaster, I chose the Seamaster in the end. 
the one that really took the first step into the modern era, a true classic, reimagined and restored. One of the most elegant, beautiful watches that Omega has ever made and that I have ever experienced.